Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Smart Money Circle. I'm your host, Adam Sarhan. Today on the show, we have a special guest. His name is Sean Miller, President and Portfolio Manager at Miller Asset Management. Uh, formerly, Sean had managed up to $500 million. Sean is a very good guest, and I look forward to uh, sharing his story with you. Sean, welcome to the show. Thanks, Adam. So, Sean, can you uh, begin by telling us your story and how you got involved in the business? Sure. Uh, I really started about when I was about age 13 or 12 or whenever 1983 was. Um, I... Uh, my father was a, or uh, he's deceased now, but he was a doctor uh, here in Virginia, an orthopedic surgeon, and he had also um, got his Harvard MBA um, before going to the uh, University of Virginia Medical School. And he had always dabbled in money management, and so I had begun to learn from him. Compounding that was one of my best friend's uh, father's. Uh, owned all the McDonald's uh, in and around um, our area, Charlottesville, Virginia, and actually owned up to about, I think it was uh, 33 or 40 McDonald's at one time, and he was very successful. Wow. Uh, and and uh, so I saw the combination of my dad's interest in investments and, of course, the, um, the wild success of someone who was an entrepreneur and uh, a franchisee and who clearly had uh, more than a million bucks. And at that point in time, my father said to me, you know, if you doubled a million bucks, essentially 10 times, if you doubled, sorry, if you doubled a thousand dollars 10 times, and this is in 1983 when I was like 12 or 13. Yeah. Uh, if you double a thousand dollars 10 times, it becomes a million bucks. Right. And a million bucks is a psychological hurdle, a lot of money in 1983. And this, uh, this friend's father who, you know, had... Um, just nice cars, DeLoreans, Ferraris, Porsches, um, and uh, but who was clearly the nicest guy. He, he was always um, benevolent to me, allowing me to sit in the cars and kind of enjoy the cars. Uh, but um, his, his success really spoke to me. Um, how was I going to get a million dollars at that point in time? And my dad telling me that, um, that simple math, about doubling a thousand or doubling a thousand dollars ten times, I figured that was the way to do it. Was 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 through the um, through the finance community, and I didn't know if that I didn't even know what investment banking was, but I did know uh, that I wanted to be exposed to some kind of investment um, uh, professional life in some way at that point in time. It just so happened that uh, after that, I met my dad's uh, roommate in college from Dartmouth, and he happened to manage one of the biggest uh, investment firms around that you've probably never heard of, which is called SEI um, in Wayne, Pennsylvania. And they, they uh, manage uh, uh, institutional money for um, and do back office processing for, for some pensions and uh, say like the Ford Foundation and that kind of stuff. They, they are in the background for, uh, for managing money that way. And over time, I developed uh, a relationship with this individual and um, he taught me more and more about what the investment options were in the investment community. And I, and after college, I eventually landed at a firm called Sanford Bernstein. Uh, and uh, I was in several different offices of that, of, of Sanford Bernstein, um, eventually becoming a, um, a vital part of their, uh, both um, Palm Beach and then the, uh, helping to start their Washington, D.C. office. And uh, they are a value-based investment manager. And I basically earned my wings uh, at Sanford Bernstein, which then allowed me to uh, to branch off and uh, become part of a uh, fledgling investment operation for a bank here in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, and that's where I uh, really uh, learned from another individual. Uh, and uh, after about 10 years there, I went off on my own. Oh, wow. So that's um, th that's really the genesis of it all. Um, you know, like anybody else in any kind of industry, it comes down to people who have influenced you in life and, and who are willing and uh, interested in, in kind of serving as a mentor from time to time. That's fantastic. It almost sounds like you had not, you know, the Rich Dad, Poor Dad book series. Instead of one Rich Dad, one Poor Dad, here it looks like you almost had three Rich Dads. <laughs> In some sense. Yeah, I, I guess I, mean, I wouldn't say my father was rich. My father was one of the. Um, um, we did uh, we did live in a nice neighborhood, but I um, 
Uh, I always joke that we lived in the um, in the um, in the poor area of that neighborhood. And um, no, I, I, uh, I mean, in, intellectually, yeah. let's put it this way: intellectually wealthy. Let's put it that way. Yeah, intellectually yeah. wealthy. Intellectually no wealthy. Question. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's... I, I had I had a great of uh, I had a great number of um, folks available to me to um, to really show me uh, not necessarily the ropes and the finer details, but just to, to guide me. That's fantastic. And then after Bernstein, what ended up happening? After Bernstein, I went to um, my wife uh, uh, wanted to go to med school, and we were in Florida at the time. I was with um, Bernstein in Florida, and then uh, I transferred to Bernstein in Washington, D.C., and we were engaged at, at that point, and my wife wanted to go to med school, so I suggested the University of Virginia Med School. It was then incumbent upon me to get a job in Charlottesville, Virginia, and it just turned out there was this uh, quirky bank called Virginia National Bank that was looking to hire essentially two guys with um, with uh, with good backgrounds in uh, in pretty advanced investment management. One guy came from a hedge fund, and then I had a, I had the more traditional asset management background um, coming from Sanford Bernstein. And at Virginia National Bank, our our mandate by the board of the bank was simply to not lose money. And oh, so we mandate. were. Uh, <laughs> that's a good mandate. And yeah, and so. We um we did it in the best way we knew possible. This other individual's specialty was um, distressed assets, whether that means uh, equities or bonds. And uh, then my side was uh, more traditional management. And uh, so together we put together a, a great track record and uh, and over uh, a number of years, ten years to be exactly, we uh, we we tracked it just uh, south of five hundred million in assets. And uh, had a track record that was very en- enviable, north of 10% per year, actually well north of that. But um, uh, and then as things came to pass, um, the um, uh, the board and the governing entity of the bank, the officer of the uh, of the control of the currency, said we need you guys to have kind of more management around you um, because you're essentially good at what you do, but uh, it's not, you know, we, we just simply need more structure around you. And at that point in time, the bank began to build the um, the entity, which we had founded and, and really been successful with, with a lot of unnecessary people. Uh, and he and I both thought after a couple of years of this that um, it would be better if we just went on, on our, out on our own. So he formed his own RIA, and so did I. Oh, that's great. So just to clarify for the audience, can you just explain what distressed assets or distressed investing is for those that aren't familiar sure, with the term? Just- Distressed assets, if, if people remember um, a company called MCI, which uh, was a um, telecommunica- telecommunications company in, um, in the early 2000s, um, they, they or any company undergoing um, uh, poor financials in their business where they can't cover, where their products are not covering the cost of running their business, sometimes they will uh, issue bonds. That are not issued at 100 cents on the dollar, where the where the bonds um, are issued at say like 50 cents on the dollar. Right. And those are what's known as distressed bonds. And so you buy these distressed bonds, which have a high uh, coupon associated with them, say in the seven, eight, nine, ten percent range, and you buy these bonds at 50 cents on the dollar and hope they'll trade up closer to 100 cents on the dollar. That's what distressed bonds are. Distressed equities are essentially the same thing, where, where, but it's on the equity side, and the equity side is a little bit more risky because bonds are higher up in the capital structure. So, in the event of any um, bankruptcy, uh, liquidation, bankruptcy, yeah, right. yeah liquidation, you're going to have a higher with bonds. With bonds, you're going to have a higher call on any residual assets than equities. So, there's undervalued assets, and then distressed assets would be just assets that are under severe stress and they're extremely inexpensive, but there's more risk associated with them for whatever external reason that might exist. Is that a good way of exactly. summing it up? Exactly. And, and, and the reason I used um, MCI is we were an active buyer in MCI bonds at that time. And we bought them at about 50 cents on the dollar and they traded up to about 80 or 90 cents. Oh, wow. So we did, and we're getting, and we're getting paid the high coupon um, all during that time. So we're getting paid to wait as the terminology is. And, uh, so it, it's a good way to invest. It's not my style. It was his style. Um, but uh, distract, uh, distressed equities are another example. Say buying uh, Tyco during the period of 
um, corporate malfeasance when Tyco went through all its issues with right. when they were throwing million, million dollar Birthday parties, parties and that kind right, of thing. Right, right, right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then if you had bought Tyco directly after that, you actually would would have done okay. Right. But that's a distressed that's a distressed equity. Understood. So that's a perfect segue to my next question. Can you please let us know or explain your investment strategy for the audience? Sure. Um, I'm an unconstrained opportunistic investment manager. I love so that. what does that mean? <laughs> Unco- unconstrained unconstrained means I can basically invest in in any geography. So whether it's the US or continental Europe or uh, China or, or India, you name it. I, I am I can go I my, my clients allow me to invest anywhere geographically okay. as well as in any in a, in any capitalization. So whether that's small cap uh, securities, mostly stocks or mid cap stocks or large cap stocks, or in any capital structure. And you and I just kind of discussed this regarding distressed assets, but the capital structures, whether it's the 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 bonds or the preferred investments of a company or the equities of a company. And so I can I can I am basically unconstrained to invest anywhere I want wherever I can find value. And I do so opportunis- opportunistically. Oh, what does opportunistically right. mean? Right. It means that I'm just waiting for a security to have um, what we in the business call a margin of safety um, where, where I, can, um, I can invest in that security at a, essentially a 30% discount to what I believe the security's actual value is. And um, so a lot of these, um, a lot of these, uh, you know, opportunistic events are like when a, when a company goes through a major acquisition or when a company spins off um, or privatizes itself or introduces new product or is hit by um, uh, some new regulation, all these things may cause the security price to drop um, or rise. Um, but more often than not, um, you know, if a company is uh, hit by a new regulation, it'll cause the company um, price, uh, the stock price to drop, at which point we know, because we've done our research, that if the security is priced 30% below where we think it should be valued, that's an opportunistic time for us to purchase the security. So that's really that oath. Can you explain the uh, margin of safety concept, but not so much. I get the fact that you're looking for that undervalued, but the deeply undervalued stock. But how does, you said it's 30% below what you think is fair value. How do you, I know value is subjective. So how do you determine, or what are some elements you use to determine the fair value for a stock? Is it trailing PE? Is it forward PE? Is it other metrics? If you can just explain that a little bit to the now, audience. We're, yeah. So we're, 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 um, we're strictly uh, balance sheet oriented so we would um we don't estimate our values based on um uh so based on discounted cash flow analysis so usually people are one of the two if they're if they're fundamental managers like us and fundamental meaning non-technical managers we don't buy and sell every second of the day based on um on volumes and that kind of thing we are we are looking to buy security and hold it for a long time um, and that's really what a fundamental manager uh, can be defined as. But a margin of safety is um, if we if we look at all the assets of a company and the debt of a company, and it all works out to a security price of ten dollars per share, um, uh, based of, based upon only the assets and the balance sheet of the company, um, and it's it's trading at ten dollars per share. We want to buy when the market offers us a price of somewhere between $7.50 or $7 a share uh, to buy in. And at 30, that approximate 30% discount is the margin of safety. And uh, that allows us uh, to have some, some discount in the security price to where, where it was originally trading. That makes sense. So, and it, and, yeah, yeah, and so that's, that's all we're trying to do. Another way of saying it is we're, we don't think the market is efficient. Lots of lots of folks um, think the market or the efficient market theory, um, which, which which generally says that all prices are where they should be. So if IBM is trading at one hundred dollars today, uh, then then that's where it should be. Well, um, we're not a buyer of IBM, or we don't like IBM. But if we thought that um, IBM should really trade at seventy dollars per share, 
then we would just be patiently watching it and researching it on a daily basis until such time that IBM reached seventy dollars a share, where we knew the fundamentals of the business were not um, catas catastrophically impacted, and where we knew that the security, security IBM would initially tr would would eventually trade from seventy dollars a share back up to one hundred dollars a share. Got it. That's so, that's yeah. that's the march of safety and 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 kind of the efficient market theory all in one. Right Understood. There. Understood. So your view is just to find the value of the stock by looking at the balance sheet. So by doing that, you're just looking at the assets, the liabilities, the capital of business, the other organizational structures as far as just the numbers, the income, expenditures, things of that nature. And then you determine the value of the, of the company. And by not being technical yes. means you don't look at the charts. So you're making decisions based on the company itself, not the stock. And then if you find an right. attractive value, you can get 30, 30, 25, 30 percent less than that. And then once you see the stock hit your level, then you'll be good to go and you can make the investment. That's right. That's, That's right. Perfect. So is there anything else yeah. to your strategy that you'd like to share? Or is that a good overview? That's a pretty good overview. I mean, in terms of, um, uh, you know, but buying buying cheap is the best way way to um, to really uh, hedge against risk. And so if you employ, and as many managers do, the margin of safety principle, then you've really eliminated a lot of, a lot of the risk that could be incumbent in that security. Um, said another way, uh, folks who don't employ a margin of safety, where they just buy based um, upon you know, the stated fundamentals and everything that is current in the security and, and where they haven't done their research to determine what they really want their margin of safety to be, that, that trace can go, go against them very quickly. And so I tend to think, and a lot of managers like me tend to think, it's a lot less risky way um, to invest when you employ the margin safety principle. No, that makes perfect sense. And that's a perfect segue, Sean, to the next question. How do you handle risk? And what mistakes do you see people make with respect to risk management? Uh, well, again, you get, you get rewarded by buying cheap assets. Um, that's that's the beginning and end. So, um, uh, you know, you, you really want to research the securities as much as you can. Um, and, uh, you know, and really, um, you know, do as much as you can in terms of investing within your circle of confidence. And so, you know, a lot of, you know, I, I know financials and I know technology companies and I know real estate. Um, and I know consumer cyclicals and consumer staples and that kind of thing. You know, what I don't know that well is energy, right? So um, you won't find a whole lot of energy exposure in my portfolios. Um, that doesn't mean I won't invest in energy, but when I do invest in energy, I want to make sure that uh, I understand, you know, what are the metrics that are uh, dependent on the energy in industry for me to fully understand it. You know, what are the drill, what are the rig counts? What are the, you know, the volume flows in terms of um, um, gas into and out of the country? You know, just different kinds of things that I don't know on the top of my head already. And, and that's what I mean by staying within your circle of confidence is lots of managers like to wander outside of what they really know and, um, and don't stay in kind of the pond that they're best in. And they really uh, damage themselves in terms of um, – Investing in things that they that they don't know, say like internet companies or or whatever the case may be, where where you know valuing them may be um, more of an opinion than based on fact. Yeah, so it's, um, it's so, um, basically the, the advice is, if I understand it properly, is stay in your lane, find the areas that stay you're, in your yeah yeah well well said, stay in your lane yeah. So yeah. what what mistakes do you see people make with respect to risk? Is it in addition to you just said style drift? In other words, chasing the latest shiny object or the latest, you know, the hottest right. name du jour or whatever the headline is. It's you know people jumping all over X Y Z Bitcoin or tech stocks or LMNOP. It doesn't matter. So you're saying avoid that. And then what about position sizing and money management? How do you build a portfolio? Would take your initial position size. Do you use stop losses? You know, can you speak a little bit to the, about that, please? Sure, I'll answer your first part, kind of on a um, on a top level uh, basis. Is is you know how do you how do you avoid risk and that kind of thing? And um, in the in the wide world of managing money, um, the number one way I uh, 
avoid risk is by investing very simply. And so simple is not easy. People think that um, simple is just investing in mutual funds or or doing kind of a 60-40, 60% equity, 40% bonds, um, asset allocation portfolio, and that you just kind of deploy assets in, in, in that kind of 60-40 um, asset allocation, and you just let it sit and boil up. Right. Well, no, um, and that's not that's not what simple investing is. Simple is staying in your lane, like we already discussed, but not being drawn to an overly complex solution. Um, one of my favorite examples of this is, you know, we all remember long-term capital management, where right. you know a couple of those a couple of those guys were world-renowned Nobel Prize winners. You know, right. Robert Merton and Myron Scholes. Um, those guys constructed such a complex portfolio, and so many of their investors thought they were such geniuses. Right. And that and that and that complexity gave the illusion of control. Right. Um, people people really like the idea of these these um, these really smart quantitative PhDs. guys. Yeah, super PhDs. Um, control, All that yeah, kind super of stuff. Super PhDs. Right. C- controlling and what they what these guys lost was that. Leverage kills. These guys were leveraged thirty to one, if not more. Right. And that, and that, and that, the complex products, investment products that they were using, really didn't decrease risk, but added risk. So um, I think the number one thing in terms of managing risk is don't go down the rabbit hole thinking you're too smart. Keep it simple. Right. Invest in securities. Invest in securities you know. Invest in um, industries that you know. And and just understand that even the smartest guys in the room, obviously I'm making reference to the book, um, is 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 you know even those guys get it wrong, probably fifty percent of the time. Yep. Right. And that's so, okay. And then the so other just, side of that too, Sean, is that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and and so and just so just being smart about it and um, managing risk in by staying in your lane and knowing your securities. That that's the easiest way in terms of. Managing risk on a structural basis with a portfolio, yeah. I tend to think a more concentrated portfolio is better. Okay. Most of my positions, as long as I have conviction, start at three percent, which is not very standard for the industry. A lot of the industry starts positions at maybe one or even a half percent. Um, so if you I had a just, if just you, sorry, Sean, just to illustrate, yeah. explain it for the audience. So if you have a hundred thousand dollar portfolio, you take three thousand of that and you put it into one idea. Whereas, yes, yes, whereas it, other people might put one thousand dollars into that idea. Yeah, now, exactly. Now that so, that's uh, not that's just to clarify too. That's not from entry to exit, so there is no stop loss. Like you're going to lose three thousand dollars if it doesn't work. It's just, hey, I'm going to take three thousand dollars and invest it in X Y Z. Is that correct? I may have I may have stop losses on the entry price of the security. Um, trailing trailing stops at around um, five to seven percent down. Okay. Um, so. I hope to I hope to cap the losses at at you know five to seven percent maybe ten percent if I really believe in security, but yes, out of every hundred thousand dollar account, each of the say twenty five securities um, or or so I own and I try to limit it to twenty five securities yeah. um, will will um, will be at a three percent concentration or slightly greater. So um, what is the rest of the portfolio if you've got Three times twenty-five equals seventy-five, or um, um, you know, uh, you know, seventy-five thousand dollars allocated. Um, you know, I, I tend to have a high amount of cash in the portfolios at, at all times. Somewhere between fifteen to twenty percent of the portfolio remains in cash at all time, and that be, that's because I want to have the dry powder to take advantage of any market dislocation. And um, new having cash as a yeah new opportunities yeah. And, yeah. I, I, yeah I want liquidity and and having cash is really you know you you have to force yourself to to have cash right you know that's actually a, a good um, portfolio management technique so, um, and um, it gives you the discipline to be a provider of liquidity um, um, rather than a rather than um, you know you want to you want to be able to buy when the opportunity is right so, so is that's, it say, that's is it, you go ahead sorry. Yeah. So being um, being a holder of cash, and um, you know, I, I like to say to my clients that cash is a good decision, so good decision pill. Yeah, is right. It, that I take every morning. Is it safe to say that you view cash as an actual position in the portfolio? I do. In Understood. This, yeah. yeah. In the, in this era of low interest rates, yeah, where bonds.
bonds have become um, significantly overpriced, um, I view cash as a, as a true portfolio position at at least a 10 to 50 percent allocation. Got it. And then um, just to understand the risk side of it, too, if you take a 3 percent position, and this is just me using my head here, and have a 10 percent stop, that means you're risking 30 basis points on the overall portfolio if you're wrong, more or less. Is that correct? Correct. In, gen in correct. general yeah. terms. So, yeah, so yeah, you'd lose yeah. $300 out of the 100000 if you're stopped out for a 10% loss from your entry. Yes. Got it. Correct. So one or two ideas blow up, or, you know, it, it barely budges. It, 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 the, the portfolio is still fine. Or even a few ideas blow that's up, right, it's still okay. That's right. Because okay. you've, um, you've, you know, you've got the high cash position. Right. You've got the other, you've got the other well-researched um, ideas, uh, positions that, that, that are there to, there to buffer. And, and so it's... um. You know, it's just how things are. Like corning, I, I'm a big owner of of corning. Um, corning has gone up like five percent this year, right. um, whereas all the other securities in my portfolio are in the twenties. You know, it's um, it's um, it's frustrating, but you know that's just the way it is. My, the higher performers, I've made up for the lower performers. Oh, exactly. And and ticker symbol for corning is GLW for those of you that are listening. Um, okay, fantastic. So the next question I have for you, Sean, is what is some timeless investing advice you'd like to share? Well, there's a lot, um, but Take, I'll start with, um, sorry, by I'll the, start with the one before you, before you start, start with, oh, sorry, Sean, before you start, yeah. all, all I would say is take your time. Uh, meaning, so meaning, give, the, meaning give the, as much as you want. <laughs> That's what I mean. Okay, great. <laughs> I think, um, I think in the investment industry, so many people get, um, interested in what the fees are, whether it's 1% fees or whether it's, um, Oh, what, one and a half percent fees on an investment portfolio, or on a million dollar portfolio, you get charged uh, for a one percent fee. You get charged ten thousand dollars per year for the manager to manage that fee. Right. One of the best, one of the best uh, forms of wisdom I've ever heard and been exposed to, and was taught early on, was the value of performance based fees. Performance based fees are fees where where if you hand me a million dollar portfolio and I make 10% on that portfolio for the year. So I make you a hundred thousand dollars on a million dollar portfolio. Performance based fees are where you usually take a percentage of that, of that hundred thousand dollars at the end of the year as your fee. Normally it's around 20% in the industry. Right. So I believe performance based fees of 20% are some, something that directly aligns the interest of both the manager and the client in, 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 in absolute terms. It gets the manager and the client on the same page. And my best example of this is if, if someone, if a client is being charged a 1% fee on a, on a million dollar portfolio, right. and, they're, and, they're, and their portfolio goes down 20%, well, that, that portfolio goes down to $800,000. The manager's fee goes from ten thousand dollars to eight thousand dollars it right. doesn't really change that much but with the performance based fee the manager has to make up the loss of two of uh, when it goes down from a million when it goes from a million to eight hundred thousand the, <clears throat> the manager has to make up that two hundred thousand dollars of fees before he's well, allowed no, 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 no. to charge Let's clarify, Sean, not two hundred thousand in fees two hundred thousand in losses right oh yeah 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 two hundred thousand sorry two hundred thousand yeah. dollars in losses before they're allowed to before they're allowed to charge performance based fees. So, so sorry, makes, Sean. Before you go, let me just jump in and clarify. So, there's something called the high water mark in investing. That's correct. And that basically means the highest level of the portfolio at any given time under your management or under any individual manager's time managing that portfolio. Once there's a drawdown, meaning the the portfolio declines in value, that which is normal happens to everybody. That high water mark is the bar that must be passed before the manager can get paid performance fees again. Is that correct? Correct. So if yeah, the, Adam, you're, you, yeah, yeah. So you're showing your skills as a, as a true, um, as a true, um, uh, investment professional, um, and my, um, my not so skills on, uh, on, that's on not my thank you, you, you for the you kind words but that wasn't my intention yeah. <laughs> the second half of that the first half okay but not the second so i just want to clarify no, because uh, i i know this is some complicated yeah. stuff for a lot of the audience so you had a million dollar account you're down 20 percent, which is happens it, 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 it does happen now the account value is at 800 
if the manager is getting paid fixed management fees of 1% that before at the million dollars, he'd be paid 10,000 for the year. If it goes to 800, he'd be paid 8,000 for the year, even though there's a 20% drawdown. Now, if there's, if there's no management fee and there's what you call performance fees, the manager, let's say the next year he's up 10%. So he makes 80,000 on that 800. He's not paid a performance fee until he gets back above the million, the high watermark, which in this example would be a million dollars. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. That, that's so, how it separates so, what, so from a manager's perspective in terms of risk, um, the manager has skin in the game um, in, terms of, in terms of managing the account. Performance-based fee managers uh, are, are generally less risky in their management of assets than asset-based fee managers because of what what you just explained. Because they have to recoup the loss if they incur a loss back to the high water mark. Right. And a lot of people don't understand that. Um, and because because the manager has skin in the game, essentially an aligned incentive with the with the client, it really builds a, a more consistent relationship. And and the and in my uh, experience, the client really learns to trust the manager more because they truly are geared for not losing as much um, in in volatile market times and for uh, making gains in the portfolio at a more responsible level of risk so, so it's um, that's one of the that's one of the more um, that's really the benchmark and, and fundamental thing I, I learned very on very early on and it's really allowed me uh, to look eye to eye with my clients and um, and have clients to stick with me for a longer period of time because they really identify with performance based fees. Understood. Um, so just to so, clarify too, Sean, yeah. jump in if you don't mind. So you're recommending uh, that the first piece of timeless advice is make sure that the manager's interests are aligned with yours. And in your example here, you're saying that one of the best ways of doing that would be only performance based fees. So if the client's making money, the manager's making money. And if the client's losing money, the manager doesn't make any money. Is they, so you're saying no management fees, just performance fees. Is that what you, if I hear you correctly? Um, or um, or you saying or both? Low management fees as uh, yeah, as low management. You're you're pro- probably not going to find a manager that um, that charges just performance based fees. I would say as find a manager that charges very very low um, fixed fees. Mine happen to be in the forty to fifty basis point range, which is a half of one percent. Or so, um, and then I charge twenty percent of profits. So, okay. uh, you know, not the one in twenty, not the one percent and twenty percent of profit. Definitely not the two percent of management fee, and then, fees and twenty percent of profits. Just find as low a fixed fee manager who also charges a performance based fee because it directly aligns gotcha. the client and the manager. Gotcha. That makes perfect sense. Um, the other, the other kind of other quote that maybe. Um, a manager that uh, that you heard of is I, I happen to like uh, Leon Cooperman of Omega Investments. Yeah, of course. Um, and and um, he's actually um, beginning to um, slow down a bit. But one of my favorite, and it doesn't it doesn't directly relate to investing in the quote, but one of my favorite quotes of his, and I'm sure he got it from somewhere else, is it doesn't matter whether you are a lion or gazelle. When the sun comes up, you'd better be running. Right. And to me, the, and to me, that speaks to, you know, small investment firms like mine, you know, how do you compete with the larger firms? And it's just you have to be searching for ideas every day from when the sun comes up to when the sun goes down. You got to be running because otherwise you're going to be the gazelle. If you're running, you know, and, it, you know, it, and you might just be the lion and, and have a good day in terms of performance. And and um, cho- choosing good portfolio ideas, but either way, you better be running because you either got to be the lion or the gazelle. So, and I that has kept that yeah. has kept me going through my entire investment career is just working hard, continuing to turn over rocks, i.e., investment ideas wherever I can find them, is really the other uh, key to to being a a manager of investment assets is never stop reading, never stop looking. I love be it. the lion. Not the gazelle. I love it. So what are some examples of when you're doing that running of some of the good ideas that would have shown up? You mentioned uh, MCI earlier with distressed asset example, but as far as just going that extra mile, if you will, and while you're running, 
what are some things that you would learn or pick up that others might miss if they're not always running? Okay. You know, a lot of um, a is, lot of people listening to this. Um, sorry, Tron. Let me just have, clarify. Well, let me just clarify yeah. the question. So, I don't mean necessarily doing more research. I mean, are you looking? That's what I'm trying to understand. Are you looking at, in other words, researching more stocks? Are you looking at more balance sheets? Are you looking for investment ideas outside of the balance sheet world? Or, I mean, that's kind of just. I'm curious a little bit on the actual research part of the equation or the running part. Is sure. it talking to other people? Sure. You, you get that. That's kind of where I'm going with this. Okay, so my research filter is um, is really to look at the ideas of the best managers and in institutions out there. That's where I start to begin my research because if you're looking at the at again Leon Cooperman, um, if you're looking at what he is buying and selling, he has um, he has a research step that's probably in the hundreds. Right. And so you have you have hundreds of MBAs just at that one firm. For are researching good ideas to invest in. Right. So if you're looking at the ideas of, of Leon Cooperman and other managers, say, um, um, you know, with Third Point or, or, um, or Kinecos or whatever the case might be, all these great hedge funds man are out there, hedge fund managers that have had just great track records, you know, Warren, Warren Buffett obviously being the, the best example. Um, if you're looking at what they're buying and selling, it tends to narrow your research universe very quickly. Oh wow! Um, what you, what you don't do is take their ideas simply as gospel, and you simply don't buy everything that Leon Cooperman is buying, um, um, or sell everything that Leon Cooperman is selling. You just use it as a beginning filter. Then you start looking at the balance sheets and other um, uh, other financial statements of these uh, particular securities. How leveraged are they? You know, what is the management's in indication toward in, uh, being shareholder friendly? You know, what is the dividend? Uh, what's the earnings quality? All these things contribute to whether or not we at Miller Asset Solutions are going to are we are going to buy this security. And so um, that is the really uh, you know some people might call that cloning. Um, I don't call it cloning because I'm not I'm not I'm not immediately implementing every idea at every hedge fund hedge fund manager. That's not what I'm doing. I'm just using it as my initial filter. And I, it's a very efficient. It's a very efficient way to do things. After that, I have you know my own metrics for what I want. Um, you know, balance sheet to look like, EBITDA to look like, PEs look like, um, and it all varies per industry, right? Because you know some yeah, some industries like financials don't don't you know some of the metrics don't apply to them. Right. So um, um, it just it it, com it comes down to what I'm finding. At the various managers or institutions, it could be the, um, you know, the, um, you know, the Virginia retirement system. What are they buying and selling? Um, you know, I don't, I don't really believe that the Virginia retirement system is kind of the best manager around. But it's interesting to see what they're buying and selling because it's a lot of employees who work for, say, the University of Virginia or the state of Virginia. It's a lot of those employees' retirement. Right. So why not look at what they're buying and selling? So that's um, after that, it really it royal, really boils down to, you know, does the security security really meet um, the um, you know the metrics that I want to see in the portfolio, and uh, you know on on a day to day basis, there's really only four things you can do when with a portfolio, and that's take more risk, take less risk, do nothing, or go to cash. And that those four things are the only four things you can do on a daily basis when you purchase or sell a security with your with your with your portfolio. Obviously, when you purchase security, you're taking on more risk. Right. When you when you sell, you're taking on less risk. If you do nothing, then you've just mostly researched most of the day, and you've gained some more insight into a security. If you go to cash, well, that is a very um, dramatic um, conclusion to come to. Obviously, probably during a very volatile time. You know, again, going back to the earlier part of the conversation is we like to have, say, 15, 20 percent cash to take advantage of, vol of volatility when it presents our when it presents itself to us. Understood. So, but yeah, so, but it really comes down to those four things. Take more risk, take less risk, do nothing or go to cash. No, That's I, all you can do. I love that. And then, um, Sean, just to clarify the, the going after the gurus or the the elephants in the room, so to speak, and studying what they do, which I love that approach, by the way. It's, it's a very, very smart way to start the search or narrow the criteria down. 
Do you know? Um, do you ever cross reference to see if more than one of these quote unquote all star managers are buying the same stock, and then reason look at the reasons why, like almost like a Venn diagram, if you will? But absolutely, okay. absolutely. And there are there are research, um, um, uh, you know, opportunities for this. There, there's different websites and and um, research platforms that allow you to really drill down on um, on who is buying what and when and and how much. And so uh, you can, um, and so you can see the overlap between you know three or four of your most favored managers that they're all buying this one security, right. and that of course is a is an indication to me that I better get on it and and see and dig into the security in terms of their financials and see if it really fits, or at least so, understand um, why. I mean, at least see it and put on your radar. And if you choose not to do it, that's fine. But at least see it and understand what's going on. Exactly. Right. Yeah, and so it it really is. I mean, um, for smaller shops like mine, it really is a more efficient way to um, uh, to really start the research process no, because you're it. you're just lever you're leveraging the research um, firms um, at all these different hedge funds, and you know you're not paying for the MBAs; they are right, right? Yeah. So uh, or the CFAs, whatever the case may be. Yeah, no, it's it's um, almost, it's almost so, like a um, yeah. if you're going to buy a home in a new area and you look and you see ten high end stores and restaurants and supermarkets all open up over there, you know it's an up-and-coming neighborhood. They've done their research on the demographics. They've done their research on everything else that you possibly want. And if these stores are, quote-unquote, it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me to buy a house in that area. <laughs> right. For lack exactly. of a better way exactly. of going. You know, you don't have to hire all the researchers and do all the demographics and all that kind of fun stuff. I, I get that approach very, very much. I mean, it's a, it's a really smart way of playing the game. So – uh, next question for you. What are some common investing mistakes that we haven't already covered that you'd like to share with the audience before we wrap it up? Um, I think um, just, uh, you know, people tend to think that, again, I'm big on um, complexity. Like, don't don't be overly complex. And an example of this would be um, mutual funds is, you know, people investing in mutual funds is, is an efficient way to do things because you're um, you're you're owning a piece of a pie. Um, and the pie owns, say, three or four hundred other securities. But what you don't see is that you know you could probably do a better job of selecting securities yourself, rather than um, investing in that mutual fund and incurring those mutual fund fees. Um, I always like to say that a dollar saved in costs or a dollar saved in fees is actually worth than a dollar earned from investment returns, um, especially if you factor in taxes. Um, so if you're saving a dollar in fees, it's it's essentially a risk-free return to investors. So for going to mutual funds and going with a manager that that doesn't charge um, large fees, or it, again we covered this, but um, who charges performance-based fees, you know, free free fee reduction, not investing in in high-priced products like mutual funds or anything like that. Um, fee reduction is really the purest form of alpha. Or, or um, return generation that someone can get. Another thing that you know I think people do is um, you know they go to these firms where transparency isn't really um, the um, the beginning and ending mandate. Uh, transparency meaning um, you know I disclose all my fees and everything I own to all my clients. There's no question that a client cannot ask me that I will not have a truthful answer to. You know at some of these larger um, investment firms. They just want to invest in a bunch of mutual funds and charge a high fee and, and not be as transparent. And this is often a, um, uh, you know, a mistake that investors make is being smitten by, you know, these uh, large investment firms um, in these marginal portfolios. Um, you know, these are not kind of the rule of thumbs like don't don't invest in, you know, in, in utilities during rising rate environments, that, which, which I think is more of a question you're asking. But I like to really spin it on the, on people's heads and say, what can you do to really get the best returns per dollar of fees that you um, that you invest? And that's that's really my um, best approach to investing. And 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 um, is really don't pay that much for it. And when you do, um, make sure you know you're getting um, as close to the investment professional as possible. Um, I might be belaboring this point, Adam, but. Again, at larger investment firms, they've got high-priced economists, they've got relationship managers, vice presidents, et cetera. All these people do not add meaningfully 
to the performance on your account. They are intermediaries that are costing you money. When you go to a smaller firm or a firm that's strictly based on stock picking and, and, um, and generating investment returns, as opposed to a marketing firm that just wants to attract your assets, um, if you go to a marketing firm, there are lots of people between you and your um, dollars that are invested. You want to have the closest path to the person making investment decisions as you can. And that's really one of the best ways to ensure your investment portfolio performs um, at the lowest cost, at the least risk. No, that makes perfect sense. So um, not just low the fees. Earlier you mentioned also buying low, so using that margin of uh, safety into the actual no, buying as well. No question. Yeah. And this and this and this comes um, to play with. Um, say I uh, were lucky enough to get two clients, two brothers, uh, um, as clients. Uh, you know, today after this call. Right. Um, y- you know, these these two brothers would would probably be invested in the same thing. If their father had previously been a client, um, they would probably the brothers would own something different than what the father owned. Because the market has changed over time. Right. At these larger investment firms, you will likely own the same thing as what the father owned, simply because they've got a model. Understood. And they don't deviate from the model. It's almost like um, you're an you're an Excel spreadsheet. You're not a person. You're just a, a, a exactly. number. Exactly. And so they just push a button, and your investment assets are deployed. At if they're deployed now, I believe it's more at the top of the market than the bottom, and that's not as much value for you. Why not wait for your why not wait for your pitch? As Warren Buffett says, there's no call to strikes in investing. You can wait until the perfect time to invest your investment dollars. Right. You don't have to invest your assets immediately. So, it. you know, it, it it all boils down to being methodical um and again, the margin of safety, looking for discounts, lower fees. That's that's all of what my firm is about. I love it. And um, and what I think um, most investors should look for. Unfortunately, they're usually smitten by the you know by the by the large fancy conference rooms and and being offered a Fiji water and and you know a high priced water or a high priced latte and saying and you know it kind of plays into the client's expectations that oh I have arrived and that kind of thing. Understood. Well, I have a nice conference room and Fiji no. water too, but, <laughs> but it, understood. It's understood. Just, it, it's just much more simple, and right. um, and you don't have to pay for all the um, intermediaries and and uh, everything else that goes along with financial firms. Understood. Watch your financial firms. No, that's really good advice. And then, um, what the final question here is: What is the best advice you've ever given or received? Uh, the best investment advice uh, well, I've any, ever um, any advice, not just investment. All right. So the best advice I've probably um, received is from my father. Is um, like 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 him, um, I was uh, headed toward a medical career, and um, turned out that wasn't going to be for me. And and uh, he said, you know, people when it really boils down to it, people care about either you know they care about their health or their and or their money in their life. When it really boils down to it, you know, you can't really live without without some form of money, and you certainly can't live without health. Right. So health or health or money, choose one. And and in terms of career, that'll serve you well. Nice. And so you know, obviously, obviously, I went with the went with the money versus versus health. Um, my my wife's a doctor, so that kind of covers the health side of the equation in our family. Nice. But um um you know it's um that's really the best investment advice I've ever um, received. It's not really germane to a lot of people. Um, you know, the the best investment um I've given. And it again relates to doctors. Um, is um, you know it's like the Hippocratic oath. I always say, do no harm. Right. So um, and uh, so in investing or in life, whether you're whether you're a banker or an architect or a doctor or wherever the case may be, just do no harm. Do the it. best for your client, the people you are you are serving, in as efficient and low cost and meaningful way as you can. Just do no harm, do not lie, be honest, um, and and you know, just go forth knowing that you've done your best. But but do not get mixed up in businesses where where doing harm is um is kind of the, the mode of um 
mode of operation. Understood. And, um, you know, I, I, I would say that, you know, like gambling and that kind of thing would be that kind of thing. Gotcha. Gotcha. So health and wealth. I love that. And then uh, do no harm. That's also great advice. Is there anything, Sean, that I yeah. didn't ask that you want to add? Uh, you know, um, I think we've covered it. Um, you know, one of the, um, you know, just investing is difficult. It's difficult, but it can be made simple. I know I've kind of belabored this point, but you really, um, if you invest simply and thoughtfully, you will, you will do well over time. Beautiful. So that's, um, that's basically it. Some great parting words. Well, thank you very much uh, for being here, Sean. Before we go, what is the best way for people to get in touch with you? Thanks, Adam. I've enjoyed it. Uh, the best way for people to get in touch with me, uh, my phone number, which is actually, um, uh, it's, a, it's a great phone number. I just happen to like it. It's 434-825-0000. So it's easy to remember. And then my email is Sean, spelled the correct way, S-E-A-N at MillerAsset.com. Asset is singular. Or www.MillerAsset.com. Beautiful. That's it, Adam. I appreciate all your time and interest and um, look forward to continuing the conversation. Likewise, and thank you very much for being here. This was really, really helpful and educational. We'll talk again soon. Thank you, Adam. Take care.